So talking about color, effectively we won't get into like a ton of the science of it, honestly, because I don't know a lot of the science of it. Um, but generally, um, color is viewed through visible light waves, right? So they fit. The spectrum is not very scientific, but you have all these different waves above the wavelength of visible light and below the wavelengths of visible light that you cannot see with the naked eye. And then you have these visible light wavelengths, and then these are the different wavelengths, give or take in nanometer, if you guys are interested. Um, but that's basically how we perceive different colors through these observed wavelengths, right? Um, effectively, there's different colorants that align with those different wavelengths, right? And so objects will modify light by either absorbing or reflecting those wavelengths. So generally, like an apple, like the red of an apple we see is because, um, I always do this backwards, is because the wavelengths that are not red, basically, if it's a red apple, are absorbed by the object, and then the red wavelengths are reflected, and that's what we see in the eye, in my unscientific explanation. Um, so that basically gives an object what they call local color, it's inherent color, right? So you see like rays of light are reflected to our eye, you see something red, so I just explained all that. Um, so basically red is the only color that's hitting the apple that's coming back to our eye, right? All the other wavelengths are absorbed by the object, right? How the object determines which wavelengths are absorbed, I have no idea. It's just how it works. That's, I'm an artist, not a scientist. So I don't know all these things. But basically, different wavelengths are absorbed, other wavelengths are uh, reflected, and our eye picks those up, right? We have uh, color wheels. You guys, I say should, but maybe not, but should be relatively at least somewhat familiar. You've seen a color wheel. Um, Isaac Newton was one of the first to develop the circular diagram, not necessarily the color wheel as we know, but to start thinking about color scientifically. So you have our general primary colors, our three primaries. And then we have our secondaries, which are mixes of those two primaries. So we have our green, which is the mix of yellow and blue, orange, yellow and red, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have tertiary, tertiary colors. I always say that wrong. Tertiary colors, which are further mixes of those secondary colors. So we have the blue and the green making sort of a turquoise, and we have a more of an orange, yellow orange here between the orange and so on and so forth. And you can break it down. Color wheels can get more advanced than that. Um, but the least advanced color wheel essentially would be this primary colors or one of the secondary colors. Um, this is the artist spectrum, which is sort of more the color wheel as we know it as artists. Again, there's some that are a little bit more advanced, but this is generally the sort of more, most basic artist's color wheel. So again, you can see, and there's different versions. This is just like one example of it. But they all basically have the same information. So you have your primaries, and then you have your secondaries, which are mixes of those primaries. And it kind of shows the mixes. And then, again, the primary here, or the, sorry, the secondary here. And then you have your intermediates or your tertiaries. And then again, a primary and all that. So you can see how the colors relate. Um, then you have, uh, so yeah, primary colors, blah, 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 secondary colors, intermediate, tertiary. I just went through all that. And then you have complementary colors on top of that. So complementary colors are any color that's opposite on the color wheel. So you have the main, the main complementaries are green and red, yellow and purple, and blue and orange. But basically anything, so this yellow, orange, and blue, violet are technically going to be the complements. The red, violet, and the yellow, green are technically going to be. So no matter how simple or how uh, advanced your color wheel is, those, that complement relationship is always going to be sort of related directly across, right? We'll get into that more later. Attributes of color. So hue. So basically... To super simplify it, hue is the name of a color, right? So red is the red hue, right? So the indiv individual wavelengths of light, right? So those wavelengths that are reflected by objects. Um, so this shows the six major hues, very similar to um, primary colors and secondary colors. You have magenta in there as well. Um, they're very similar to... Um, like printing colors as well, screen and print colors. So you have your CMYK, there's no black in there, but CMYK and RGB, similar kind of thoughts. Um, so um, 
yeah, you have the six major hues there. So hue is what we talk about when we when we mention like the actual color. So if you're talking about something that's blue, you're talking about the hue of blue. Uh, then you have intensity or saturation or sometimes chroma. Um, so basically the intensity or saturation is a relative brilliance or muted quality of the color. So effectively we have our true hue here and then as the intensity or saturation is brought down all three of these colors kind of go to the same sort of sickly gray at the end. Um, even in the next step you can start to see that hue become less muted as it moves over to the right. Um, sometimes it's referred to as chroma, not often, but sometimes it's referred to chroma. The time where I personally have seen chroma referred to is in video editing. Um, so it's usually when you selectively, like purposely select a color for editing, so you're selecting that chroma. Um, so like green screen, um, it's that, that specific green because it's an easy chroma to, to key out since it's like that crazy like fluorescent green color, right? Generally doesn't pop up very often. Occasionally you'll come up here and there, you'll see a newscaster that'll wear something that's greenish and then the, what's it called? It happens with uh, meteorologists all the time. Or that somebody might wear like a green tie or something and it might be close to the chroma that they're keying out so then like the weather map behind them will actually be like in their tie as well. Um, usually in video editing is the only time I've ever really come across chroma used a lot. But basically chroma is another, um, another term for that saturation or intensity and that's why that chroma green is like that crazy bright obnoxious green. Generally because it's easily selected. You have value, which is the relative darkness or lightness of a color, often gets confused with saturation. So saturation doesn't technically change the color. It's just the intensity of the color, right? Um, where value actually kind of changes the color, right? So it's going to be dark or dark here or light. So it's it gets often interchanged, which it's not supposed to be. But you can see even with the value being the darkest of these three colors, I mean, they're fairly similar anyway, but they look really, really similar on each end of the value spectrum. And I think that's why it gets confused a lot with, or used interchangeably with hue and sat or with intensity or saturation, because you have when the saturation is completely off, it's basically gray. But the difference is, again, the hue doesn't change it's just how muted it is. So even here, like the hue from here to here to these two different values is very, very, or these two different hues is, is very different, right? So you're basically adding, you don't really add white, but you're adding white or you're adding black to create those values, right? Uh, then we get into um, some color relationships, right? So we talked about complementary colors. We'll get into that a little bit further. But we have... Uh, analogous colors is a very common um, color relationship. It's basically hues that are adjacent next to each other uh, on the artist spectrum. So like in this case, for this image here, you have these three, maybe even four, analogous colors. And basically you can't, and that to be an analogous color, you basically can't skip a color. So you might even be able to push it definitely to this yellow, definitely to this red, you might be able to push an analogous color. It doesn't have to be three, it can be more than three, um, to this purple. You basically can't skip. So if you had this um, layout, whatever, design, and if you had skipped this color and added just this green, that would no longer be an analogous composition, right? Because you've skipped a color. Um, you could potentially push, if you use this yellow and this green as part of this, um, Color palette, you could potentially get away with using a, a calling that an analogous color relationship just because they're next to each other on the color wheel. Um, and again, this analogous color happens in nature all the time. So we've seen it before. So with this plant, technically this is an analogous relationship because you would effectively pick one green that sort of matches in here, and then you have greens and yellows. And you could even potentially even push it towards more towards the yellow orange, depending on how something looks in nature. So it pops up in nature all the time, not just in design. Um, monochromatic scales, so monochromatic relationships. Um, basically monochromatic is the pure hue with either light, uh, with either rather white or black. So you have white leading you to tints of the pure hue, 
and adding dark or black, giving you shades from the pure hue, right? So again, a very different thing to what we were talking about because you're effectively changing um, hues, right? So you're using a monochromatic scale um, and technically you're changing the hue by adding black or adding white for tints and shades. Dun, dun, dun. And then we have color harmony, which is a color relationship. We mentioned interior design in this class before. It comes up a lot in interior design, but design in general. Um, but color harmony are basically two or more colors that are sensed together in a single pleasing collective impression. doesn't necessarily have to be in, as intense as this one on the left, um, but these are two good examples. This blue is pretty intense in both of them. But you can have a relatively intense, relatively jarring color with this kind of crazy lime green furniture we have. Um, and even though that color relationship between all those blues and this sort of jarring lime fluorescent green, um, or yellow green, whatever you want to call it, it's still it's a relatively jarring relationship, but there's still a color harmony there, right? It's not jarring into the which we'll get into later. It's not jarring to where it's not like unpleasant, right? And then that's kind of pleasing and unpleasant are kind of like grayish, you know, what might be pleasing to somebody. This might be completely jarring to somebody in this room. It might be super subdued to somebody. So it's a little bit relative. Whereas this image um, is a color relationship similar to the one on the left, but the colors are a little bit less jarring, right? Even if you had this blue if this blue leaned a little bit more towards like a, a violet blue or something like that, then you would have more sort of similar colors that are less jarring with this sort of more washed out reddish pink and the blue. So two different color relationships with some similarities, one being the blue, but one sort of showing you a more jarring um, color harmony versus a sort of less jarring, a little bit more subdued color harmony. Um, you can have harmonious groups. Um, based on spatial relationships from uh, one color to the next along the color wheel. Um, they don't necessarily have to be right next to each other like analogous colors, but um, they can include complementary colors, monochromatic colors, and analogous colors. Um, hues of close or even equal, or equal or even close values can be considered harmonious. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, you can have complementary contrast. Um, it's basically what happens with uh, two complementary colors in a relationship uh, have an interaction, which we'll get into in a couple slides, um, even if they're um, slightly complementary, right? So even if they're just a little bit off from technically complementary, like similar complement colors will have an, a reaction. But we're talking about harmonious groups here. So in these two examples, these are harmoni harmonious groups. This one is a little bit more saturated, intense. Obviously, the uh, objects are a little bit more refined, and objects are tighter. You have more defined squares here. But all of these colors, while they're not exactly similar, they're related in some way, right, between these harmonious groups. This is a different, using similar colors, except some yellows in there. You can even have these harmonious groups with something like a color, like this gradient. It's like a softer color wash. You still effectively get the same effect or that same sort of harmonious um, color grouping, right? Um, going to harmonious groups with patterns um, and compositions, um, generally, and these aren't all hard and fast rules, but generally more successful compositions um, tend to be because the saturation is balanced. But basically balanced composition in some way or another, we'll talk about balance in a couple of topics, um, but whether the balance is symmetrical, asymmetrical, what have you, um, you can balance through color as well. Uh, but when you have a balanced composition, that's usually when you have the most successful compositions, right? Um, as far as color goes, that usually either refers to the saturation level being consistent or equally balanced or uh, between vivid and muted elements. So in this case, in these two slides or two examples, we have this leaf pattern. Um, the saturation level is pretty even across that entire swatch, right? So all the greens, even though they're very different colors, like this light green and this light yellow, or even the dark green and the dark yellow, the intensity is still consistent across that whole swatch, right? The consistency or the, the intensity is still like fairly muted, right? Even with this, which has a lot more detail and a lot more colors, the saturation is still fairly muted and still fairly even across the entire swatch. 
and then you have this swatch where you have this balance between really intense, really saturated color, in, including the black. So you have these areas of very rich saturated colors balanced really well with the, when we talked about positive negative space earlier on in the semester, balanced well with this negative space figure ground relationship with the areas that are um, the areas that are blank, right? So you have, even though this is very asymmetrical in design and color, it's still very balanced, right? So you have this really dark, intense magenta color here, this large area balanced by this essentially one large, you could kind of even include this hand here, but this one large area of white. And even in design, you have this sort of coming from the corner to the middle here, give or take. And then in this, you largely have the corner coming into the middle. So even as far as area, the two areas are balanced in size, right? Um, so you can balance solid, intense colors with areas of negative space, right? This is where we can get some um, color reactions, right? So often referred to as color vibration. Uh, this more often than not happens with complementary colors. It can happen with similar complementary colors or just very, very vibrant colors, right? So basically color vibration is an effect um, that takes place when you have complements or near complements together. And sometimes it literally gets like this. It makes your eyes vibrate. Um, you can get, uh, when they're placed close together or on top of each other, you can literally get visual vibration. Um, often they're hard to read. So when you're using text, as you can see in the slide, when you're using text, um, they can be difficult to read just because of their intensity. You can get after imaging. Um, I don't know if you guys have all tried this before, but at some point in your lives, you probably tried the there's like a, I always forget which way it is. I forget, it's a blue dot on a white page or a yellow dot. One of the two. But you stare at this like, we'll say yellow. You stare at this yellow dot for like 30 seconds or whatever, and then you look off to a white sheet or a white wall, and then you get almost like a purplish, bluish after image. That's because it's a compliment. You can do that with, uh, not that I want to give you guys bad driving habits, but if you're at a stoplight, if you just stare at the taillight of the car in front of you, for a while, and then when the light turns green, try to look off to something light, and you'll see like a green after image because red and green are complements. Um, so this just happens in nature all the time. So you can see with red and green specifically, with the red on green and green on red, especially red on green, you kind of get this like intense, almost vibrating effect, just the way we optically receive these things. Same thing with the blue on orange, but even with like similar, like the cyan and yellow are not complements, but they're close. So you still get that sort of intense, um, you get that intense reaction. And this can be done on purpose. Um, sometimes you want that color vibration, right? A lot of times, like in the 90s, 80s and 90s, you had these like really intense like geometric patterns that like were purposely these obnoxious colors and had these relationships to give you that sort of like sense of vibration, that sense of motion. Um, so you just have to keep that in mind. So sometimes you would use these on purpose. Sometimes you would not mean to, and then you would need to adjust, right? Um, the next slide, I'll give you a warning. It's pretty intense color-wise. I didn't do it this morning, and I got a whole bunch of... So um, so this is a good example of... Yeah. So this is a good example of that sort of color vibration that can happen. This was done with a very, very much, very uh, intentfully. So even if you, like, as I'm rocking back and forth, if you kind of look or adjust, or even if you kind of move your eyes a little bit around the picture, it almost looks like it's moving in and out, right? You get this weird undulating movement, and that's because of that color vibration, right? So you can purposely select colors and use this as color and pattern. There's a whole lot going on here, but you can use color and pattern to purposely, and I'll stop, um, to purposely get this sort of like intense color vibration or color reaction, right? So you can create optical illusions. You can create a sense of movement, like literal movement without actually having an object move. Um, other ways to play with color. Um, Stroop interactions are relatively interesting, relatively fun. Um, so it's basically when uh, colors are seen with simultaneous and conflicting information. It has to be conflicting. Um, that's the important part. So like in this case, a green stop sign, right? Stop signs are never green. We're all sort of conditioned to learn the red stop. So like when you see this like conflicting information, it takes our brain, our, our eyes and our brains to like figure it out for a second. And it could be like a millisecond. Um, but sometimes artists play with that to sort of purposely kind of like disconnect your brain from um, from different things. You have a strip reaction with things like this. So again, sometimes it takes a second to like 
it, sometimes it's notable. So, sometimes it's noticeable. Sometimes it's not. But if you try to even to yourself, if you try to read some, like some of them are correct, but if you try to read some of these words, like it takes you like a quick half a second to adjust a sec, you know, because you're reading green and it's an orange and it just kind of trips up your brain just a little bit. It reminds me of an Instagram filter that's like timed and it'll say a color. Oh, yeah. Like it'll be a different color than it yep. says. So you have to like. You have to manage your brain. You like try to quickly like yep. get what it is. Yeah, exactly. And like unconsciously, your brain has to make that decision. So sometimes like, again, we don't conscious a lot of times. We don't cons consciously think about this, but especially with color theory and artists that work a lot with color theory, like they'll do that a lot so that like you might, for whatever, I'm trying to think of an example and I can't, but for whatever reason, like you might be looking at a piece and like you're finding it compelling for some reason or you're finding it like, not in like a creepy way, but you're just finding it like off a little bit and you're finding yourself looking at it more and more. Like a lot of times it's because they're playing with color theory and there's this like subconscious disconnect in your brain that's sort of making you interact with this piece more, which is kind of kind of interesting. So a lot of times when you use that conflicting information on purpose, that's that Stroop interaction named after, I'm sure, the person that invented it. Um, then we get into actual color theory, right? Still with interactions of color, and then this is some of the, some of the stuff that we're going to start to explore in some of the assignments, right? Um, so Joseph Albers um, is uh, studied color theory and chromatic interactions. Um, he's sort of one of the I don't know, I hate using the term forefathers, but one of the forefathers of actual color theory. It's a scientist that studied color. Um, it's where a lot of color theory comes from. Um, but a lot of times what he studied was this simultaneous contrast, right? And basically what simultaneous contrast is, is that colors will interact with each other differently. And they will appear to be different because of that interaction. Does that make sense? So, as a visual example, all of these chips will say, of purple, right? These small swatches of purple are all the same color. Same color, same hue, same value, same tone, all it. It's the same exact chip, but they look different depending on what colors they're interacting with, right? So for this one, based on the red and the blue background that they're put on, the hue might slightly change, right? Depending on how it's not as intense, unless my screen's at an angle. Um, but the hue will slightly change depending on the background that these are put on. The value will change. So again, these three are the same color. So the value will seem a little bit darker if it's put on a lighter background. And it'll appear lighter if it's put on a darker background. And the same thing with chroma, right? So it's way lighter or it appears way lighter because you're putting it with a similar color that's darker. And then this color purple looks way darker than this color purple just given the background that you put it on, right? So you can affect how the eye, and it's all how the eye is perceiving it. This is all science that I don't know. Um, but it's basically all how your eye is perceiving it, right? Through these color interactions. So it's sort of a little test-ish, not really. There's the background color, so the, the white, the gray to black on both images is the same. There's a set of four purples. There's two sets of four purples here, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, two sets of four. One set is four of the same purple, and one set is four different purples. Can we tell which one is which? Does anybody want to guess? The, one on the, right. the right one is the one that's different? Let's see, I don't know why I want to put that down. You are correct. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to see on screen because um, I think the pixels have a tendency to play with it a little bit. But you can see, and now that we know, it's kind of hard to not see it. Like, I feel like it's once I see it, like, I, I can't, even when I show the slide today, like, I can't, as soon as I pull up the slide, I'm like, I know, obviously, because I made the slide. But I know which one's different, so I can't unsee it. So if you go back, you can still kind of see it that the one on the right is technically different colors, right? This one's a little bit lighter than this one. But these look almost exactly the same, right? And that's due to that color interaction. Since both grays, or both gray to black, these four and these four, are the same, they're effectively appearing as the same. It also doesn't help that they're both together as well in the same slide. But, but you can see, again, this is the same color. This is a different color. So due to these color interactions, you can actually sort of change perception of colors, right? 
And then we're going to move into a little bit, again, sort of relating to our um, upcoming assignment. Um, there's some influential work that I'm sure you've seen before. You might not know it, um, but works of Mondrian or similar. Uh, Mondrian and neoplasticism has been used in design in a variety of different, I mean, there's like bed sheets of like Mondrian like, or Mondrian um, like designs. Um, but basically, neoplasticism is, uh, comes from the Dutch, a term de stiel, uh, which is, means the style founded in the early 1900s in Amsterdam. But basically, it was uh, ultimate simplicity and abstraction. And really, what it is, is, so abstraction is effectively distilling an object down or objects down into their most basic formats, right? So neoplasticism took that even a step further. We're like, okay, not even just basic shapes. We're going to use specific shapes, so only straight lines, only horizontal and vertical straight lines, and rectangular forms. So they didn't even use rounds in neoplasticism. So they were distilling designs or distilling objects often down to even more than just the basic shapes, right? Or even less, I guess, in this case, than the basic shapes, right? And then their formal vocabulary, meaning what, what they used, uh, was limited to the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, and three primary, value, uh, and three primary values, uh, black, white, and gray. So that was generally their color palette was, for, they limited, not only limited their shapes, but limited their color palette. Um, they tried to avoid symmetry but still attained balance. Again, going back to design balance, um, like the magenta a couple slides ago. But since we have this very dark blue, it has a sort of more physical or optical weight um, than this red, because the, the value is much different, right? So you can get away with having a much larger area of red to balance this sort of heavier optically area of this dark, dark blue. Uh, and then again, that's balanced out by the larger paths of white and yellow here. Um, but again, I'm sure we've all seen, I mean, there's, like I said, there's, there's been bedding that is made with uh, Mondrian type work. So it's, it's so ubiquitous in our culture that we've, I'm sure we've seen it before. And then our friend Andy Warhol, um, again, probably you might not know it was him, but I'm sure we've all stumbled across his work in some capacity. Um, a lot of times he would, he fits into neoplasticism as well, um, pop art as well, which is related. Um, but again, sort of distilling things down to, um, uh, either their, na their most basic shapes or in Warhol's case, more, more, most basic colors. So a lot of times he would distill things down to, um, complementary colors or sets of complementary colors. So he would limit his color palette, um, to effectively play with. The interactions of color. So even here with our classic Maryland picture, same exact image, just repeated nine times with a variety of different um, color relationships, right? And you can see how the feel, the mood, whatever you want to call it, even the detail, right? Like in these two, they're slightly more lifelike, um, but the detail in the hair and the face is a lot more detailed than let's say this top right corner and especially the bottom left corner, um, they get really washed out. Details, you lose details or you gain details based on different color relationships. Um, some you have, because of some color relationships, I tend to see this, I don't know if you guys do, but I tend to see this top right one. I almost get the sense that because of the background and because of the face color, that I get this like the face almost drops back. Like I feel like that darker green recedes into the background where the red and the yellow I feel like is above like almost floating above the green I think that's because of the complementary relationship you have these two the red and the green with this complementary color so you're getting that sort of vibrating interaction but then you also have close complementary colors here with this you know leaning towards red but orangish but between the, the sort of orangish yellow to the green, you almost have this green-red complementary relationship. So he explored um, he explored color. Uh, one of the things he did was explore color in that way. And one of the other reasons that he used cultural icons, uh, such as Marilyn at the time, there wasn't a person alive that didn't know who Marilyn Monroe was. Um, so it was a recognizable figure. Um, and that way you also concentrated more on the color relationships as a viewer, whether you knew it or not. 
the intent was more to uh, study those color relationships rather than the subject. He was also sort of of the school of like the ready-made and appropriation and things like that. So that was just kind of what he did. He took he took sort of like pop culture, cultural, very well-known cultural things and appropriated them and used them for art making in general. But in the cases of his silk screens, he would do uh, more sort of color studies like this. And that's something that we'll explore uh, in our upcoming assignment as well.